Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the medicine meeting that uh, the Division of Geriatrics is hosting. The topic of um, medicines in dementia could probably have been represented by a blank slide and the sound of crickets for 45 minutes, but I think um, in the new era, we are hoping that we'll make some breakthroughs. Uh, there's a lot of controversy, which I think Anu will touch on. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else follows it as much as we do, but um, drugs that were sort of pushed for by Big Pharma against the geriatric community and then have been pulled from the market, re-sort of defining diseases according to uh, pharmaceutical definitions. So these are all the things that we are arguing against. So welcome to Anu, who is um, our consultant here at the GEN, um, Anu Abraham, and she's going to walk us through what to use, what not to use, and just some general management principles. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. And welcome also those uh, joining us online. Uh, so for my first... Oh. So uh, my first slide shows history of dementia. So my, I'm hoping I don't just uh, kind of bore you, uh, but I thought it was important to just have a little background of how far we've come with regards to dementia care. Uh, and so just to help better appreciate uh, where we are right now. So back in ancient Greek, Greece times, Hippocrates, Plato, uh, Pythagoras, and uh, Aristotle, they all had this notion that dementia was normal part of aging. And I think it was Pythagoras who put down his uh, triangles and rectangles, and he came up with the notion, by the time you hit 60, your brain dis dis becomes to decay. And by the time you hit 80, you revert back to something like a baby. So that was his theory. And it wasn't until the first uh, century AD, a uh, Roman encyclopedist by the name of Celsius, he actually coined the term dementatus, and that stands for out of being out of mind. Uh, and so after that, we ended this uh, er era of medieval times. And this is where um, religion was a bit more um, popular than uh, science. And so if you were diagnosed with a any cognitive illness, uh, you were likely to be uh, subjected to exorcism, being locked away or even put to death. So it was not a great diagnosis to have. Uh, later that, in around uh, 1600s, we went into an era of witchcraft or witch trials, where all across Europe, we saw hundreds of particularly women patients who are uh, aged as well as uh, with mental illnesses being burned alive on racks, uh, burned to ashes. And finally, we went into the uh, Victorian era, and this is where asylums or lunatic asylums or mental asylums, they called it, and um, were established. So. Many of the asylums, they weren't really that bad. Some of them had uh, really large uh, gardens and uh, recreational activities for their patients. But unfortunately, if your mental disease was uncontainable, you would be subjected to straight jackets, bloodletting and purging and ice baths amongst other modalities. So and this picture comes from a guy from, from one of those era. His name was James Morris, and this is how he was tied up uh, back in an American uh, uh, lunatic asylum long ago. And so finally, we ended the 20th century. And this is where in 1906, we had the German uh, physician Aloise Alzheimer's. And then he did an autopsy on one of these patients and found uh, tangles and amyl plaques, which we now are uh, neurofibrillatory tangles and amyloid plaques. And it was about four years after that, his junior Emil Krumlin uh, credited him with the, uh, the disease under his name. And after that, slowly the asylums became replaced by mental health uh, hospitals and nursing homes in the 1906 uh, times. And so since then, we kind of realized dementia, uh, uh, you know, we learned the biochemistry of dementia, what, what is a pathogenesis, but we also realized there's no cure for this uh, condition. And we then started to medicate patients, trying to uh, treat their um, neuropsychiatric or cognitive disease uh, ailments. Uh, but then we also realized that some of these drugs that, that we use didn't sit well with the older person. And a lot to do of this has to do with the physiology, the physiology of aging. 
So as we grow older, about 20 to 40% of increase in uh, fat composition is there. So that's a particular problem for fat soluble drugs. So a longer half-life, for example, diazepam, there is, can be a 20% decrease in your uh, muscle mass and also a significant drop in your water uh, constitution in your body. So that also affects how uh, water-soluble drugs are uh, metabolized. So your lithium, digoxin, and uh, gentamicin, uh, amongst others. So th these drugs have a smaller volume of concentration and a high plasma, sorry, solid, smaller volume of distribution and a high plasma concentration. As you age, your albumin also decreases, so protein-bound drugs become a problem. Classic example, phenytoin, and also there can be a 30% drop in your GFR as you advance in age. So again, water-soluble drugs. And also finally, there can be a, a, an, a decrease in your phase one metabolism and one age. So you're seeing a lot of the toxic metabolites lurking around in your bloodstream. And finally, you know, with the physiological changes, we know as we age, we've got various illnesses. Uh, and so some of these illnesses affect your blood brain uh, integrity. And together with that, uh, renal impairment, liver uh, failure, or even cardiac failure changes the fluid constitution of your body and affects how drugs are metabolized and uh, excreted. So one of our passions in geriatrics is to scratch out medication. We sit there and do this every day. Uh, so some of the drugs that we love to scratch out are delirigents. So uh, these constitute your central acting drugs, so your hypnotics, uh, benzodiazepines, uh, narcotics, uh, antihistamines, uh, your, your antispasmodics, uh, fluoroquinolone uh, to some extent, uh, and anti sorry skeletal muscle relaxants or bladder with the relaxants. You also have to ask or inquire about over-the-counter medication that your patient is taking, antihistamines, anti-nausea, um, uh, mandra, canbane, or jimson weed can also be found. So um, one of the reasons why we don't uh, prefer to use these drugs in our patients is all based on this cholinergic hypothesis. So it was discovered about 20 year, odd years ago, where as you age or advance in age, or particularly with neurodegenerative diseases, especially Alzheimer's, uh, these patients have a loss of cholinergic function in their central nervous system. So this is part of, I would say, normal aging as your age uh, progresses. And so the minute you give them an anticholinergic, you're dropping the little bit of acetylcholine in the synaptic clefts and you push them into delirium. And the long-term use of anticholinergics then uh, subject you to developing uh, uh, amnestic disorders, falls, bladder issues, amongst others. Okay, so there's some drugs that have high anticholinergic burden. I'm sorry for the fine print. Uh, and some that has low or moderate cholinergic burden. And the high ones are, for example, that under antidepressants, amitriptyline, paroxetine, um, antipsychotics like clopromazine, and even carbamazepine. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the list of the low to moderate anticholinergic drugs, fluoxetine, um, loperamide, digoxin, and even Lasix, you kind of realize some of these drugs you can't really do without it. We have to use them, it's what we have. Uh, and so particularly in all the patients, what we find is the it's not the particularly the one single drug that causes a problem, but it's a combination of drugs that put together, especially when there's polypharmacy around, then the different drugs with different anticholinergic properties increases the cholinergic burden for that patient. So fortunately, uh, on the net, we have anticholinergic burden calculators that help us with this. You can plug in all the drugs that your patient is on, and then you get the um, load of anticholinergic load that your patient is on. Some of these are used in research, but uh, some of them, are especially the anticholinergic, the third one on the list, is freely available online. And some of, it's actually quite nifty because they not just give you the load that your patient is on, but also gives you potential uh, other drugs that you can use in your patient. So uh, when it comes to potentially inappropriate medication use in the elderly, in geriatrics, we recommend these two common tools. So one is the Stop Start Toolkit, and the other one is American Geriatric Society BS criteria, the latest version of 2023's art. So the Stop Start Toolkit, uh, it basically takes you from system to system, common drugs that you would find or use in, for example, in respiratory systems or neurological diseases. 
and it gives you the name of the drug and why you should or in which conditions you should probably stop it or you know, consider stopping the drug, so which is safe and which is not safe. I particularly like the American Geriatric Society one um, because it gives you a rationale as to why you should not have that drug or use that drug. It gives you a recommendation which drug is better and quality of evidence and the strength of recommendation. So you can base that uh, on, and base that on and choose or make an informed decision about the drugs that you use in the elderly. Uh, and of course, with uh, technology, we have these drug interaction checkers right in our fingertips. Plug in all the drugs that your patient is on. You'll get all the interactions that uh, that are potentially dangerous and cause side effects. Uh, and so uh, great tools to use. So I thought let's do a case vignette uh, just to put everything into perspective. Uh, instead of using a random patient, I thought let me uh, choose something more closer to home so it can be a bit more relatable. So this is uh, Teresa Paul. She's 93 years old. She's a mother of eight, grandmother of 19, which I am one of them. And uh, great, with some serious multiplication. Uh, she's got so many grandchildren, I don't even think she remembers how many yeah. she's got. Um, she's got a background history of rheumatoid uh, seropositive arthritis, hypertension, paroxysmal SVT. And I haven't... Uh, uh, officially diagnosed her, but she's certainly got some mild, if not moderate, cognitive decline. So she presented with a three-day history of mild confusion, sleep disturbances, lower back pain, and urinary frequency. So she had a visit for her GP at her home. So on top of the methotrexate, folate, osteocal, uh, chloroquine, and pantalog that she was already on, the GP initiated her on amitriptyline to help her with her sleep haloperidol uh, for confusion, citalopram 10 milligram, uh, and because he thought maybe the lower back pain was something related to her um, rheumatoid arthritis, he started on methylprednisone, and to top it up, tramadol 100 TDS. Um, I didn't make this up, I have the script <laughs> to show you. Uh, so uh, suffice to say, my granny went complete bonkers. <laughs> so uh, she scott wheels and all that. <laughs> so uh, with her worsening delirium, she sustained a fall and she also complained of right groin pain. So fortunately this time around she was admitted. She had a sodium of 122, an uncomplicated UTI and uh, also sustained a superior rami fracture. So yeah, that's how uh, uh, some of these cases go. And so I decided to do a, a drug interaction check around my grandma and found about 20 interactions, some of them very severe and significant to pay attention to. And her anticholinergic load gave me a score of 10, putting her at a high risk of having uh, confusion, falls, and death, two of which she already sustained. Uh, so nifty tools, uh, I encourage you, you guys to check them out. So this uh, brings me to the second part of my talk. What can you use? for dementia, or at least the cognitive part of dementia. And because I'm focusing on drugs, I'll go through quickly through the drugs that we have uh, available for us. So one of the drugs we use is uh, what we call cognitive enhancing agents. They are choline esterase inhibitors. Um, the whole principle is if you can uh, in stop your acetylcholine esterase from functioning, you get more acetylcholine available in your synaptic cleft for its various uh, neurological functions. So the ones that we have available are these three mentioned here. The, com the one that we commonly use is Donepezil, and that's purely because the side effect profile is better than the other true drugs, and also uh, it, it's a once a day dosing. So Donepezil is used for mild to moderate dementia. So your MMSE around should be around 11 to 26. These are not neuroprotective drugs. They do not have the ability to change the trajectory of your disease. So you can't reverse back from, for example, from a, if your mini Mendel was 18, you can't go back to 26. And uh, so, it, so you, all these drugs, what they do or try to do is kind of slow down the progression of disease or try and halt it where it is if possible. But uh, in majority of the cases, or not actually all the cases, the, the disease will progress. What, if, even if you give the drug, it will continue to progress. And so apart from cognition, it does help with some neuropsychiatric uh, issues that we find in dementia, as well as improving active, uh, 
uh, um, activities of daily living. So the benefits or the efficacy is moderate, right? So for example, if you use the drug for six to 12 months, you can um, see the minimental in terms of loss of points on the minimental uh, zero to one, zero point two to one point seven points per year. Whereas if you didn't use the drug, 1.07 to 3.4 points on the mini mental. So, per year. So, which means, you know, these drugs are not miracle drugs. Uh, they are, they're very modest in their efficacy. Um, in terms of whether they can improve, you know, uh, uh, limit patients from being institutionalized or progression of their disability, it's quite variable. It varies from disease to disease. I mean, some, from research paper to paper. And in various papers, in terms of mortality, reducing mortality risk, uh, relative risk reduction of 27 to 42% has been observed in various studies over a period of two to eight years used. Uh, this drug has its most benefits in Alzheimer's disease, uh, Lewy body dementia, and Parkinson's disease dementia. We don't use this drug, or the evidence is weak for other forms of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it comes with side effects, so there are GIT side effects you need to be aware of, including rhinitis, as well as um, symptomatic bradycardia and vivid dreams. That's why we give this drug in the mornings. Uh, like I said, it has a better... Donopristol has a better GIT side effect profile than compared to galantamine, for, ex for instance. And you've got to monitor your patients uh, closely looking out for drug tolerability. Um, so I mentioned one of the drugs we don't commonly use, galantamine. Uh, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but bear with me and hope I keep your attention. So uh, back, back in the days, uh, you know, Odysseus and his crewmen, they set on this Voyager trip and they came across an island. And on the island, they were met by this uh, evil sorceress by the name of Cirque. And so because the men were very tired, uh, they, she decided to give them a hot meal and some uh, drinks, but she poisoned them. She poisoned them with a drug that made them forget the land that they came from. So they had amnesia. Um, and so uh, this part, I don't quite understand. She decided to turn all the men into pigs. I still don't get it. Uh, but anyway, as uh, you know, Odysseus, as loyal as he was, he had to go save his men. So on his way, he was met by a Greek god by the name of um, Herms. And Herms gave him this uh, flower. And it, it the gods called it moly. And yes, this is where the term holy moly comes from. And uh, so uh, this drug was an, an or this plant was an antidote. Uh, to Cirque's poison. And so he was able to give it to his men and save them and uh, travel back to their land. And so um, in the, I think it was in the 1900s, a Bulgarian chemist, he got quite fond of this uh, folk tale and he alerted the medical community and they actually uh, um, extracted galantamine from this plant. And uh, it's actually called the snowdrop plant. So some of our drugs have interesting pasts and interesting history just for fun to know about it. Okay, so the second anti-cognitive uh, co enhancing agents we have at our disposal is memantine. So memantine works a bit uh, different to uh, donepecil, for example, or the choline esterase inhibitors, for example. It works on our NMDA receptors. We know we have these receptor receptors in our neurons. And the problem is if you activate these receptors too much, for example, in a period of ischemia, uh, it becomes neurotoxic. Uh, so, the memantine is said to be neuroprotective. We use it for moderate to severe uh, Alzheimer's disease where many mental is less than 30. It has modest benefits. So apart from a little bit of improvement on cognition and global uh, scale, there is some improvement on uh, orientation, your patient's ability to follow commands, praxis, as well as comprehension. Uh, and a few benefits in terms of cognitive, uh, other non-cognitive deficits. For example, delusion, it helps a little bit with the aggression and irritability. Uh, not many side effects, a bit of dizziness maybe. Uh, again, we use it mostly for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I reiterate, very, very modest benefits. Um, so some physicians, you'll see some patients on both, but the evidence for their use together is, is very weak. Uh, so often in geriatrics, once the patient's 
you know, goes over into severe, or moderately severe disease, we tend to stop the Don episode if it isn't re really doing much good for, you know, much good for the patient. Always remember the cost effectiveness before you put them on two agents. Don episode, I think, costs about 220 rand, if I'm not mistaken, and memor or memantine around 290, 300 rand per month. So these are a couple of drugs that we often got uh, um, asked about in geriatrics. Uh, these are vitamins and mult or supplements, and we always get patients asking us, you know, is this helpful? Can I take it? What's the benefits? But all of these drugs on randomized control trials have not shown any benefit in either treating your cogni cognitive decline or even preventing from you going into dementia. So in, these include um, vitamin E, selegion, estrogen, testosterone, vitamin C, omega-3, ginkgo bilo biloba, and other multivitamins. So, so rather tell your patients um, if they cannot afford it, please don't take them. Um, and if, even if they can afford it, tell them these drugs really don't cause much um, use. And obviously drug to drug interactions increases the more you put them on one of these agents. Okay, so this comes to my last um, few slides. Uh, it's all about uh, the pathogenesis of particularly Alzheimer's disease. And this is where all the uh, research and controversy is uh, going through. So just a, a quick uh, recap. So uh, in our neurons, we've got the amyloid precursor proteins. And these proteins get broken down by various enzymes into monomers or amyloid uh, beta oligomers. And these clump up together and form plaques outside the neurons and interfere with cell-to-cell -cell communication and function. Um, and then the other part of the uh, pathogenesis is what we know is the, uh, on the microtubules, you've got tau proteins, which uh, then aggregate together and uh, results in neurofibrillary tangles, which then affect the communication within the neurons and how, pro how nutrition is passed within the neuron cell. So this is where a lot of the focus of what we call, or what the pharmaceuticals call disease-modifying drugs. So I'm sure some of you have come across uh, some articles based on this. And so the first drug, and, and basically where it hits these drugs is the amyloid plaques. That's where the target is. So the first drug that was released is adakanumab. I'll quickly go through these drugs because they're not available to us. I'll remind you, they're not available in South Africa, even in the private sector. Um, there, a couple of them have been FDA approved uh, and some of them have been discontinued, which I'll show you right now. So um, adakanumab is a human uh, immunoglobulin IgG1 monoclonal antibody. It caused a lot of controversy initially. Uh, just a quick recap, uh, initially what they did was they took patients who have mild cognitive impairment. So these are patients who told you they have memory loss, uh, but uh, and you've picked it up on their cognitive tests, but they're functionally well. They, it hasn't affected how they work and, and, and um, how well they are in the environment. And or they chose patients who have mild Alzheimer's. Then they did PET scans on them and made sure they had amyloids in them on, on their PET, on the PET scan of their brain. And then they subjected them to this adakanumab. Unfortunately, um, well, fortunately, the, the amyloid burden on the PET scan reduced. So you've almost got a 71% reduction in amyloid on the PET scan. But unfortunately, in terms of uh, uh, neurocognitive uh, functioning, there was no improvement. So, and m maybe something more worrisome is the uh, amyloid related uh, side effects that you got. So there was about 35% of the patients who used the drug developed edema and micro hemorrhages in their brain. So this is not like your, you know, simple side effects like vomiting and diarrhea. This is really serious stuff. Uh, so these, um, uh, the researchers, they, there was a lot of inconsistency and incompleteness in their data. So initially the FDA refuted them and, but however, Biogen, the drug company decided to continue collect, collecting data. And later on, they found that at higher doses, they did have a clinical benefit, small, but they did have it. So because it met surrogate end markers, which is, which is it reduced amyloid, which we now, we know it's, it is the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's, FDA approved the drug. 
So this caused a lot of uh, controversy within the Alzheimer's and research community. Some of the FDA member, uh, sorry, yeah, some of the FDA members even resigned, and uh, but the F they went ahead with um, producing this drug and uh, approving it. Um, I won't go through too much into it because uh, the cost is exuberant, twenty eight thousand per year, and it as of thirty first of January this year. It has been discontinued by the drug uh, pharmaceuticals. I guess they figured out it doesn't work. Uh, so the next drug is lacunamab, pretty much the same kind of principle, uh, humanized uh, immunoglobulin one antibody, sub uh, substantial reduction in the amyloid PET scan as well. So these guys uh, did amyloid as well as CSF amyloid. So they looked at the amyloid in the brain and the CSF uh, amyloid in the uh, yeah, quantity in, in the CSF as well. So substantial re reduction in the amyloid, but this time around, there seems to have statistical improvement in terms of their uh, cognitive functioning. So in terms of absolute difference for from baseline, when they first start in terms of, they call it a cognitive dementia scale, and so the, at baseline, it was 1.2 as a score. And then when they used uh, lacanamab, it went down to 1.66. So there was a 0.45% of, not a percent, 0.45 points difference. So this is where a lot of criticism comes. For physicians to actually notice a difference in cognition, uh, on these scores, you at least need a one point drop to say that this is significant. So what does a 0.45 drop actually mean? We don't know. So, uh, but anyway, statistically significant. Again, black box warning is there. These drugs still cause edema and microhemorrhages in the brain, uh, a little less than adakinobam at 21%, one, one in five. So they found it was more common in patients with uh, upper protein allele E4 mutation, which we know those are the kind of patients that have higher risk uh, to develop dementia. Uh, respective FDA accelerated approval in January uh, last year. Uh, the, the drug will cost you 26,500 uh, US dollars per year. And this is just money for the drug. There is expenses with infusion. You need PET scans before you start the drug. You need about five MRI scans while you're on the drug. So you can see uh, the pricing will go much, much above this. Uh, and anyway, it was granted full approval in July last year. It's available. So uh, Donna Nemap, it's the latest one, same principle. Uh, this time around, uh, apart from amyloid, they looked at tau proteins as well. So tau proteins, when they're there in your CSF, it just means, uh, or or in your PET scan, it just means there's neuronal damage. The more tau proteins you have, uh, the more your disease has advanced. That's what it means. Uh, so uh, I think, again, good reduction in amyloid, but also a little bit better. So instead of 0.43 points reduction, 0.67 reduction in, in all those cognitive tests and scales. Side effects are there, but less, uh, maybe 1.6% of the participants who used uh, donanemab had serious um, amyloid-related side effects. So the whole concept is, if you were to use these drugs for the 18 months that this what these trials were done for, you can potentially avoid progression of the disease by four to maybe 7.5, seven and a half months. So it might seem small at times, but maybe for a patient or their family members, it might you know want to get their affairs in order or want to have that full cognitive function where they can still do what they need to do. It might mean some something for them, but it's still, you have to take into regard this, this huge financial implications, side effects that are for real. So is it really worth it? So it's, it's a debate. Okay, so, but uh, Lily, the pharmaceutical that's uh, in, in, involved in this drug is, um, has um, applied for FDA approval and maybe something will come out early this year. All right, so I think we've, I've proved to you that we've come a long way from my you know, Hippocrates to witch hunts, lunatic asylums, finally to Aloise Alzheimer's, telling us what is the pathogenesis of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we went back to Greece to try to look for drugs and finally to amyloid uh, antibodies. 
So uh, whether amyloid antibodies are really the, the answer to Alzheimer's disease is questionable because we always known Alzheimer's to be a multi component disease. There's multiple issues, right? It's not just the amyloid or the tau proteins. There is genetics, there's aging, there's neuro, uh, there's um, these lifestyle risk factors, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress. All of those things put together causes Alzheimer's. So as you can see, by just taking the amyloid uh, part of this disorder, we're not, it not, didn't cause drastic improvements. Um, and so that's something to consider. So then what, what do you do? What do you do uh, when you have such limited drugs in your disposal? And how do you treat these patients with cognitive decline? So this is probably uh, what we in geriatrics call a successful recipe. Um, so always practice good pharmacology with your patients, right? So use those tools that I just mentioned and make sure you give the uh, try and make sure you give your patients right drugs in the right doses and uh, appropriate uh, safe drugs. Uh, always do a comprehensive geriatric assessment uh, because if you uh, come to us and we'll teach you how to do this properly because you really can't treat your patients effectively until you do one of these. Um, follow the 2020 Lancet Commission is what this picture is all about. So reverse what you can reverse. So good nutrition, uh, exercise, stop smoking, reduce or limit alcohol use, um, you know, hearing, so hearing affects or contributes to 8% of all dementias. So try and put, I mean, if your patient has a hearing deficit, let them wear their hearing aids um, and make it always a multi-domain intervention. So always non-pharmacology first before anything else. And I said, uh, even nutrition and safety issues. And if you're really, really struck, uh, try and call us. I know it sounds like a self-advertising part of the talk, but if you're really, really stuck and you're not really sure, call us. We'll try and help you out. Um, oh, as my last slide, I must tell you what happened to my grandma. So she was admitted. Fortunately, there was a, a steward physician that was uh, on call that night. She, you know, figured out what was going on, stopped all those dangerous drugs. Uh, she put him on, treated the UTI, some simple analgesics, bed rest, and with some gentle physiotherapy, she was able to come home just in time for her 94th birthday. And yeah, so celebrating with her family. Thank you so much.